Hey everybody, it's Mike. Welcome to Chip Damage. And today we're going over a topic that I've had many requests to do. Today we're talking Nintendo GameCube. Yes. So, if you don't know, if you haven't checked lately, the Nintendo GameCube and many of its titles have become highly collectible as inexpensive. And there's two main reasons for that. Number one, Nintendo's steadfast refusal to make easily accessible remakes and re-releases of its games. And number two, this thing was awesome. People love this console and they want to keep the games when they buy them. They want to reclaim, reacquire the ones that they've sold or lost over the years. So yeah, why is that? Why do people love this purple little lunchbox? Well, stick around and I'll tell you why. Let's talk about it. Let me take you back. Let me take you back to the year 2001. Nintendo's in a bit of a weird spot. While very beloved in North America and the world over, the Nintendo 64 was not quite the financial success that Nintendo needed it to be. The Nintendo 64 in its lifetime sold about 33 million units, which was quite a bit down from the Super Nintendo, its predecessors, 49 million units. And there's a number of reasons for this. Number one, it's stiff competition. The N64 actually faced stiff competition from Sega's Saturn in Japan, which wasn't the case worldwide, but Worldwide, the number one competitor was the Sony PlayStation, which crushed the, play, the N64 three to one. The Sony PlayStation sold 100 million units compared to the N64's 33 million. And that was a blown defeat that Nintendo had never suffered before. So when it came to the next console, they wanted to come out swinging. They were gonna make a powerhouse console at a competitive price. They were gonna include third party support and do more deals, which was something they neglected very much in the N64 days. And they were gonna launch a ton of extras, peripherals and accessories, especially ones that attach to their very successful handhelds, uh, including the Game Boy Advance. And that was what would lead us to the GameCube. Let me take you to November 18th, 2001, the North American release date of the Nintendo GameCube. Now the PlayStation 2 had been taking over the world for well over a year, and this console also launched only three days after Microsoft's behemoth Xbox, the original Xbox, which took some of the wind out of the sails out of the GameCube. While the GameCube had quite a bit more graphical horsepower than the PlayStation 2, it didn't quite stack up to the Xbox uh, Microsoft's juggernaut. And there was also the fact that the GameCube did not have a DVD player, which let me tell you, sounds funny today, was quite the selling point of the PS2 and Xbox that they had uh, built-in DVD players. All of this, along with the fact that the GameCube had somewhat of an anemic launch lineup, no mainline uh, traditional Mario launching with it, much like how the Super Nintendo had Super Mario World and Nintendo 64, of course, had Mario 64, the GameCube only had Luigi's Mansion, which I smile because I love that game, but I know it's not for everybody. It's not the game you really want to launch with. Uh, along with a number of other slightly controversial releases like The Legend of uh, Zelda Wind Waker, which is my favorite Zelda, but at the time was controversial because of its visuals, led the GameCube to eventually fall into third place and stay there during the sixth generation of consoles. The GameCube would end up selling about 22 million units, down from even the N64, compared to the original Xbox's roughly 24, 25 million units sold and the ridiculous PlayStation 2 sales number of 155 million, the GameCube was firmly beaten. However, that is not indicative of its quality. Not at all. People who bought this system loved it. And I think now, years later down the line, everyone's starting to realize how great this console was. And that's why it's become so collectible, hard to get and expensive. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Some of the rare, weird, less talked about and expensive games on the GameCube that I've been able to gather. Now, while I was definitely more of an Xbox and PlayStation 2 guy, during the time of the GameCube, during that uh, generation's heyday, I've come to really appreciate and love this console. And let me know, by the way, in the comments below, my favorite thing on this channel is hearing anecdotes and personal stories about your video game histories. Were you a GameCube person back in the day? What were your memories of this console? Did you hate it? Did you love it? In general, what were your thoughts of the sixth generation of gaming? Because looking back, it's kind of my favorite, the Xbox, PS2, GameCube, and many people want the Dreamcast into that era. Like looking back, that was such an experimental time for gaming where 3D was kind of mastered, but like online gaming hadn't really come in. It didn't become big business with like microtransactions and like tons of DLC. Like every console and manufacturer trying different things. It was just such a cool and unique time. The GameCube is really exemplary of that. But without any further ado, let's jump into some of the games. And if you stick around to the very end, we'll have some bonuses. So please stick around until then. But let's jump into the games already, shall we? The first game we're gonna be talking about today, and speaking of the Dreamcast, it's appropriate, we're talking about Skies of Arcadia Legends. Yes, what is this game? Well, this is a re-release of a Sega Dreamcast RPG, JRPG in particular. It's an enhanced re-release with some uh, brushed up visuals and extra content. 
and some things shifted around. You play as a sky pirate named Vice. Now, I mean that in the most literal sense, sky pirate. You a pirate on a flying ship, pirate ship, uh, you know, getting treasure, saving the day, uh, swashbuckling action. This is a fun lighthearted traditional JRPG with that throws some curveballs at you that has a pretty strong fan base, cult following. First four figures, well known for their wonderful uh, video game statues worldwide, which I've done many reviews on, have done statues of Vice, kind of showing that there is still a contingent of people that love and remember this game. And I hope it does get more future re-releases or possibly even a sequel, but I'll take the re-release because the sequel is probably not realistic. Uh, because this game did not sell fantastically well, and henceforth is quite rare. This game can go well over $100, well into nearly $150. It's really the only way you can play this version of the game. Even the Dreamcast one is quite expensive, but this one is generally preferred because of some of the additions and the graphical updates. So please check it out if you have the extra scratch and you're a big enough JRPG fan. Skies of Arcadia Legends is worth your time. Check it out. Moving on to another slightly controversial title, we are talking about Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes. Yes, okay. Now, if you've seen any other videos on my channel, you know that Metal Gear Solid is my favorite video game franchise of all time. However, this game, like I said, it's controversial for a number of reasons. But let's talk about what this game is. What is Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes? This game is a remake of the PlayStation Classic Metal Gear Solid, the beginning of the Solid Snake kind of saga uh, going forward. However, it's a bit different. It has the engine of Metal Gear Solid 2, which was a much more enhanced game, uh, including the first person mode, crawling, uh, uh, the detection system, uh, greatly enhanced graphics, kind of all put into Metal Gear Solid 1's story. Now, why is it controversial? Well, that's because the cutscenes were directed by one Mr. Ryuhei Kitamura, who was the director of Godzilla Final Wars, uh, FYI. Great movie, which is just wacky, not for everybody. But in some of the cutscenes, Salt Snake does some stuff that's not really characteristic. Dodging bullets and doing backflips off missiles, it's ridiculous. But you know what? It doesn't really hurt the game. I love this game. Uh, do I like it more than the original PlayStation 1 version? No, it's just different. Uh, and I think it's definitely worth your time. However, it's never been re-released on anything else. It is strictly a GameCube exclusive, hence rare. This game goes for roughly $100, well over $100 uh, US dollars, wall complete in box like this. But if you're a Metal Gear Solid fan, this is worth checking out. Don't let the hate uh, of the, the cutscenes and some of the voice changes kind of deter you from playing this. If I haven't mentioned, they also kind of redubbed this whole game to kind of tone down some of the stereotypical accents of some characters. I think that's unnecessary, but it's still a voice cast that I love. This is worth checking your time out. It's a fun game to experiment with, with those Metal Gear uh, Solid 2 mechanics. It's still a great Metal Gear game at its core, and it's the only Metal Gear Solid 1 game where Solid Snake and Liquid and all the other characters actually have faces instead of blocks uh, that just kind of bounce up and down, which I love, don't get me wrong. But this is a different take on it, and definitely worth your time if you can afford it, if you're a big enough Metal Gear Solid fan. So Metal Gear Solid, the Twin Snakes, a GameCube exclusive that I love, and the only Metal Gear game on the GameCube. Now let's move on to a title that's not controversial at all. It's very well beloved, in fact. Let's talk about Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door. Yeah, so if you have a GameCube, you know about this gem, but let's talk about it real quick. Uh, Paper Mario over the last couple of years, over the last couple of releases, has been kind of up and down all around, uh, somewhat of a divide after this game. However, the original N64 game and this game, its sequel on the GameCube, are very beloved. And those games are awfully, often debated. Which one's better, one or two? It's hard for me to say. Having only sampled both, I like them both. However, I gotta say, the GameCube, some of the writing in it is just fantastic. So what is this? This is a Mario game that is actually a traditional J uh, like JRPG with some unique twist and just great writing and some fantastic, unique original characters. It's definitely worth your time. However, unlike the original N64 release, which was re-released on the GameCube and the Wii, I'm sorry, re-released on the Wii U and Wii Virtual Console, this game has never been re-released. It is strictly a GameCube exclusive to this day. And because of that fact and of how beloved this game is, it is quite expensive. This is touching $100 complete in the boxes I have here. But if you can find it, from what I've played, it's very much worth it. This game has a lot of charm, a lot of heart, a lot of like good jokes. Video games usually don't make me laugh, especially with like just dialogue, like written dialogue, but this, this is worth your time. If you tried the newer games and they weren't your thing, such as Color Splash, Sticker Star, Origami King, mm, you should know that this is kind of the game that made people really love this series. This is the original release, and you should probably give them a shot. So that is Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door, if you can find it, worth your time. Moving on to oh, a game that, yet again, has no re-release and is still very much a GameCube exclusive. We are looking at F-Zero-G-X. I love this game. So what is this? This is the last official release of the F-Zero series. I'm not counting any arcade releases. Now, F-Zero GX is a special game because it is the first game that was made by both Nintendo 
and Sega. Yeah, that is something that when I was very young was unheard of. Nintendo and Sega were literally cats and dogs, the biggest are Coke and Pepsi. They did not mix at all. But when the Dreamcast finally went out of production and Sega went into third party development, one of the first games they made was F-Zero GX with Nintendo. And it shows those two kind of clashing companies coming together to make a racing game unlike anything else. I will say this now, this is probably the most difficult and one of the fastest racing games I have ever played. It is literally, think Star Wars Episode One Pod Racer, but jacked up to be even faster and crazier. The amount of character in this game is insane. You don't really think of characters when you think of racing games. And particularly, like, the game itself has a character, it has a style. It is so fast and furious, and <laughs> that's not a joke, it's literally very competitive. And the characters that you play have are so memorable. This is something you should definitely check out if you're a fan of racing games, because there's really nothing else like it. There have been spiritual successors of uh, fast racing uh, on the, uh, the Wii U, but they never quite live up to the hype of this game. So if you can find it, it's definitely worth it. This game is getting up there in price too, because yet again, there's no re-release. And this is a famous Nintendo IP, so I don't know what they're waiting for, but this game is definitely worth your time. That is F-Zero GX. If you want to get... A Falcon punch in from the game he's originally in. You can check your boy out, Captain Falcon, in this. But we must move on. We're talking about another game that's all about speed and flash, and that is Star Wars Rogue Leader Rogue Squadron 2. Now, this was an early GameCube game that made me jealous. So, while the original Xbox was kind of the graphical powerhouse of the generation, this game showed off what the GameCube can do. Back in that time, during the prequel trilogy's kind of release wave, there were so many great Star Wars games on all the consoles, but this one really stuck out on GameCube. What this is, this allows you to play as your boy Luke Skywalker and Wedge going through a bunch of the famous space battles in the original Star Wars trilogies in a number of their vehicles, X-Wing, Y-Wing, A-Wing, B-Wing, Snowspeeder, and just reenact them with stunning detail. The graphics in this game still hold up. Yet again, this has never been properly re-released. There was a sequel to this game that had the, the levels of this title in it, but only as co-op game, uh, as co-op levels. If you want to play it single player, you got to get this right here. And just mm, seeing this X-Wing, just seeing the Rogue Leader cover brings back memories. This was the first GameCube game that a friend of mine had that I wanted to go over and play all the time. This is worth your time if you're a Star Wars fan or if you're just a uh, Flight Sims, or if you're just a fan of great games. Star, Star Wars Rogue Leader on the GameCube. Check it out especially for all my Star Wars fans. Not super expensive yet, but yet again, this has never been re-released properly, so I can see this one going up in price very quickly, especially with the somewhat uh, rise in popularity of Star Wars with shows like The Mandalorian and Star Wars Visions. Check this out, GameCube exclusive. Now, we're going to another racing game, but a little bit of a different flavor than FCO. We are talking about Kirby's Air Ride, a famous game on the GameCube that is actually getting quite expensive now. The condition I have this game in right around now, complete in box, about $80. What is this? This is a one-button one button racing game. Yeah, this game does not have complex controls. However, it is a racing game featuring the Kirby cast that is just so much fun. There's battle racing, there's regular racing, much like Mario Kart, but it's just a different flavor. There's different grip, there's different traction on the road. It's... There's just hype courses where Kirby's flying through on his little star through a city, and there's just a certain charm in this that you don't find in Mario Kart, kind of a uniqueness. So if you're looking for just a fun racing game that has great battle modes and single player modes, and you're a Kirby fan, gotta check out Kirby's Air Ride on the game. Yet again, no release on this, like many of the titles we're talking about today. You can only get this on the Nintendo GameCube. But moving on, <laughs> let's go to another for uh, uh, Nintendo mascot that is Recently, back in the limelight with the release of WarioWare on the Switch, we were talking about Wario in Wario World. Yes, yeah, so believe it, back, believe it or not, back in the day, Wario, Wario was not just relegated to mini game collections and compilations. He got his own series of games on the Game Boy and the Game Boy Advance, the Wario Land series, and the logical conclusion after Wario Land would be Wario World, and he got it on the GameCube. Now, what is this game? This is like a 3D platformer with some 2.5D sections where you play as Wario, whose treasure hoard was brought to life and turned into monsters, and Wario's greedy. He needs his money back. He needs his treasure. So you gotta go out there in four stages and beat the heck out of enemies and get gold back. And this game is just a lot of fun. You go around as Wario, punching and kicking enemies, throwing them, jumping on them, fighting some wacky bosses and some differently themed stages, just trying to get money. I used to call this game Wario Gets Money, because that's what it's all about. It's just about greed. It's a great game that has never been released 
based on anything. It's one of the last games where you actually see Wario like in his traditional costume. I mean, you, you have Wario Land shake it afterwards, but like this was Wario's kind of starring 3D role. And yet again, never released on anything else, and I don't see it getting re-released any uh, time soon. So please check this out, Wario World on the GameCube, nowhere else. All right, now we're going to be talking about not exactly an exclusive to the GameCube, but games that were made famous by the GameCube that led to a lot of other franchise changes. Let's talk about Resident Evil on the GameCube. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, the game that you see here at the front of this pile was originally a GameCube exclusive, Resident Evil Zero. Uh, this came out along with this title here, the remake of Resident Evil 1 on the GameCube. Very famous title. Now, these two aren't particularly rare, but they're worth noting. Now, why is that? Well, this remake of Resident Evil kind of marked a collaboration uh, between Nintendo and Capcom, which really wasn't there in the Nintendo 64 days. Of course, there was like Mega Man Legends, but there weren't too many titles released on the N64 made by Capcom. And this kind of turned that all around. Um, Resident Evil was at a high point. Resident Evil 1 was a beloved game, but technology had come so far since the 1996 release of Resident Evil on the PlayStation and the Saturn, and that really showed here on the GameCube. This was one of the best-looking games on GameCube. To this day, this game still looks really good. It's been re-released many times, but there's not really been much to make it look better other than HD because the game always looked good. So this is a fantastic GameCube game that led to this prequel that not too many people love. Um, I'm sorry, wrong game. Uh, that not too many people love, Resident Evil Zero. However, yet again, it was a GameCube exclusive with fantastic visuals uh, that is worth checking out, but has been re-released many, many times. However, what these led to were re-releases of Resident Evil 2 and 3 on the GameCube. Now, these are very expensive. Now, what these are, these are not complete remakes like Resident Evil 1 was. They are simply re-releases with slightly up graphics and a few extra unlockables, um, particularly akin to the Dreamcast version of these games. But because Resident Evil is so beloved, and these are technically the most recent physical releases of these versions of the games, these are highly sought after, going for about $180 respectively for Resident Evil 2 and 3. And yes, you can get these games in many formats. They've been fully remade on modern generation of consoles. You can get them on the Dreamcast where they're also expensive. You can get them on the PlayStation 1 where they're getting expensive. However, the most recent physical releases of the original versions of these games are on the GameCube. So you can get Resident Evil 0, 1, 2, and 3 all on the GameCube, which of course leads us, which of course leads us to the game that probably sold a lot of GameCubes. Not as many as they were probably hoping, but a game that was legendary and is still legendary to this day. That is the original release of Resident Evil 4. What can I say about this game? It's one of my favorite games of all time. It's generally considered one of the best games of all time. And it was a GameCube exclusive for a short period of time, which must have pissed a lot of people off because this game did not stay exclusive. A year later, it came out on the PlayStation 2 and now has been released on everything under the sun. I think there are toasters and watches that can play Resident Evil 4 at this point because it was so beloved, but it was a huge release and a big get for the GameCube at the time. However, I'm about to go into some GameCube history that is well known, but in case you haven't heard, Resident Evil 4 was part of a deal with GameCube, not just the Resident Evil deal, no, 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 no. It was part of the Capcom 5. What was the Capcom 5? The Capcom 5 was a series of games that Capcom promised would be exclusive to the GameCube, lies, um, that they were gonna make to kind of show what the Game, GameCube could do. They were gonna be from different areas of Capcom's development teams, and they were gonna be all unique and fantastic titles. Well, story with that, long story short, only four of them came out, and they were all really unique and special. We're gonna go over some today. Um, the one title that did not come out, Dead Phoenix, has been documented in other channels. It was just a canceled Capcom game. But what did come out? What, what came out of this Capcom 5 other than Resident Evil 4, which was a gem that was not exclusive for very long? And as a note, this version of the game, prettier than the PS2 version, uh, but not as many modes that had... Um, Assignment Ada and separate, I believe Separate Ways was an exclusive mode in the PlayStation 2 version and there was some exclusive weaponry. However, the GameCube version does look better than the PlayStation 2 version by a decent margin. So if you're looking to go back to the 6th gen and play the original, yeah, the GameCube version is still very playable. But let's hop on to the next member of the Capcom 5. Let's look at the least popular one and the only one that stayed exclusive to the GameCube. That is PNO3. Yes. Um, what can I say about this? This was directed by Shinji Mikami, the creator of Resident Evil, the director of Resident Evil, shall I say. And uh, yeah, this is a unique title where you play as like this robotic girl, Vanessa, in the near future, and you fight what else? Robots uh, using laser pulses and like the... Like this is well known as the butt game where this girl just can't stop jiving and dancing. Um, 
This title is not particularly special, but it, there is some fun to be had, and it is wacky, and it is a GameCube exclusive that is never getting re-released, let me tell you that. And it is kind of a forgotten part of Capcom and Nintendo's history, so it's worth checking out. It's not as bad as some would say, and like I said, I can see this getting kind of hard to get because people are kind of overlooking it now. Um, I would get it now while it's still somewhat affordable. It is part of the Capcom 5, it is part of Capcom and Nintendo's history, so it is worth at least a brief uh, kind of glance at the very least. Moving on to the next title which is uh, one of the most unique out of the Capcom 5, one of the most unique games ever. We are, of course, talking about Killer7. Now, Killer7, um, this was kind of a breakout title for my boy Suda51, who would later go on to make uh, No More Heroes under his own company, uh, Grasshopper Manufacturing. But he was a Capcom guy way back when, and this was kind of his one of his first magnum opuses. This was a very unique first-person on-rail shooter where you play as uh, an assassin who has seven personalities, each with different abilities, who are all, it's unclear if they're aware of each other or not, like who like who knows what, but this is a wacky, cel-shaded game. And yes, this did release eventually on the PS2. However, I suggest the GameCube version. Um, if you're gonna get this game, you're kind of game savvy. This is a wacky game for a very uh, kind of small audience, niche audience. So why don't you get the better version? The PS2 version, while adequate, does not look quite as good as the GameCube version. The GameCube version really makes the cell shaded graphics in this game pop. And yes, while it is a two disc game, it has faster loading times uh, and it looks better than the PlayStation 2 counterpart. And it's definitely worth your time. The price of this, of course, starting to go up. So grab it now while you can. It is Killer7 on the GameCube. Uh, while available on the PS2, this is the version I get. Well, well, we're going to go to the last released version, uh, Capcom 5 game. We're going to be looking at my boy, Beautiful Joe. Now, what can be said about Beautiful Joe? If you don't know about this one, I don't know why you're on this channel. Um, Beautiful Joe is a 2D beat-em-up side-scroller in the vein of some older games, uh, past generations. It is hard. It is unforgiving. It is wacky. Joe is fantastic. Joe has become a cult hit character in the Capcom library, appearing in Marvel vs. Capcom 3 and Tatsunoko vs. Capcom and you got to start on the GameCube. Now, this version of the game is starting to go up in price as well. And there is a PlayStation 2 counterpart. Now, this is where it becomes a little difficult. While the GameCube is, uh, the GameCube version does look a bit better than the PlayStation 2 version, the PlayStation 2 version famously lets you play as Dante from the Devil May Cry series. So you must decide which of that, those is more important to you, graphical fidelity or a playable character. Now, I love me playing as Dante, but if you want a really good looking, version of Beautiful Joe that really pops, you gotta go with the GameCube version. Like I said, this was a member of the Capcom 5, it didn't stay exclusive for a while, but it's a great game that you can check out if you have a GameCube, still affordable, worth checking out. And moving out of the Capcom 5, Beautiful Joe was uh, successful enough to get a sequel, and that's what we'll be talking about next. We'll be talking about Beautiful Joe 2. Yet again, affordable on the GameCube, and there is a version on the PS2 that lets you play as Dante and Trish from Devil May Cry yet again, but the GameCube version runs a bit better, looks a bit better, loads a bit quicker, and so that is really up to you. Yet again, fidelity versus content, it's a tough call, but this is still easy to get, uh, and before it kind of gets rare as many of these titles are, I would pick this up if you want it and if you have a game, because it's a fantastic title. A bit longer than Beautiful Joe 1, not quite as difficult, a little bit more puzzle heavy, definitely a good complimentary game to the original Beautiful Joe. And if you think you're done with Beautiful Joe, if you think we're done talking about him, you'd be wrong. We got one more title here. We're talking about Beautiful Joe Red Hot Rumble. Now, this game, this game is insane. This is basically Beautiful Joe Smash Brothers, but even wackier. Uh, it, is, it can be a four-person fighting game, platforming fighting game. Now imagine very much like Smash Brothers, but just wackier with objectives, with coins raining down from the sky, with bonus uh, enemies you have to fight. You can work together, you can work against each other. This is a fun party game that is rarely talked about and it was only ever released on the PSP where it also had Dante from Devil May Cry playable. But this is the only console version of this game. Um, this is worth checking out. This is still very affordable and worth your time. If you're looking for a good multiplayer game that isn't Super Smash Bros. Melee, but almost as fun, you can check out Beautiful Joe, Red Hat Rumble on the GameCube without breaking the bank. Check it out. My boy Joe got a lot of representation on the GameCube and I absolutely love that. Uh, he, even though he's moved on to the PlayStation and hasn't had a game since, I always kind of consider him a GameCube character because that's where he kind of got his start. But moving on to a different genre and out of the Capcom 5, let's look at Tales of Symphonia. Now this is a game that has been re-released on the PlayStation 3 and it was also released overseas on the PlayStation 2. However, here in North America, it was a GameCube exclusive. Now, the GameCube kind of had a lack of really great JRPGs in comparison to the PS2. There was no mainline Final Fantasy game on the GameCube. There's only Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles, which is a divisive title in of itself. However, this is often considered one of the best Tales games out there. And this is, I can see why. This character, um, 
the characters in this are very well beloved and I can, after playing it for a few hours, can say, yeah, this is my favorite Tales game. So please check this out. This is affordable because it has been released on other consoles. But yet again, this version I can see getting very rare because it is kind of associated with the GameCube and everything on the GameCube is just hard to get your hands on. And with the recent release of the Tales games uh, kind of getting bigger and bigger, I can see people going back and buying more. So get it while you can. Tales of Symphonia on the GameCube. Great game. Moving on to a very famous GameCube game that is getting very hard to get. We are looking at Eternal Darkness. Now, I can't talk much about this game uh, without spoiling it. And a lot of this has already been said, so I won't bear, I won't repeat it. Uh, this game is talked about everywhere. But what is this? This is the, one of the best survival horror games on the GameCube. I can't say the best because Resident Evil uh, Remake is right up there with it. But this is very different. This game messed with the player. Of course, you have the infamous sanity bar where depending on what your character does and sees, the character that you play could be seeing things. It messes with the player. It can trick you into the, your memory card being deleted or the volume going up and down. This, of course, was has also never been released on any console. And I, very, I doubt very much that it ever will be. So this is a GameCube exclusive gem that is going up in price. I think it's just breached 100 US dollars. So please get your hands on this if you're a fan of horror games are just good games in general eternal darkness sanity's requiem only on the nintendo gamecube now since it turned, we just talked about eternal darkness the natural next thing to talk about of course would be billy hatcher and the giant egg what right i mean it just it, it flows it's not a non sequitur or anything what is this billy hatcher and the giant egg was sonic team's uh, kind of GameCube debut. Yes, the teams behind Nights in the Dreams and Sonic the Hedgehog decided to make their next mascot Billy Hatcher in this title. So, of course, it's a platformer, but not a traditional platformer. Good old Billy can't do much himself. He, of course, needs to grab an egg, which he will then help hatch, but while he is uh, holding the egg, he gets other abilities. He runs faster while rolling an egg. He attacks with eggs. He dunks with eggs. You have to protect the eggs, make sure they don't fall off the edge of stages sometimes. This is a weird game. This is a very weird game. I don't think it's good or bad. I think it's just like what kind of mood you're in. If you're in something for something kind of obtuse and wacky, this might be right up your alley. It was later released on PC, but those versions were not fantastic. As a console game, it is exclusive to GameCube, and its price has sh shot up very recently, shockingly, like I said, the game is only okay, but maybe because of its exclusivity, it's kind of infamy as a weird GameCube title, and maybe as a Sonic Team game, this game is getting very expensive. It might be worth your time. If you're a Sonic fan, if you're a Yuji Naka fan, this is worth checking out. It's quirky, it's cute, it's fun. Is it going to blow your mind? No, it's not Mario 64 or Banjo-Kazooie or anything like that. But it's a fun little game to check out. Billy Hatcher in the Giant Egg, <laughs> Sonic, Sonic Team's next big hit, Billy Hatcher. Mm. Right up there with Ivy the Ki Kiwi. Um, now, moving on to some licensed games. We are looking at Zoids Battle Legends. Now, for all my OG Toonami fans out there, you remember Zoids, right? My boy Bit Cloud there with the Liger Zero. There were a number of Zoids games released in the early 2000s. Most of them were not good, and they were on portable handhelds. Um, this game is not bad. This is one of the few games where you get to play as Zoids, which are basically, for those who don't know, animal Gundams, like giant robot animals, uh, fighting in battlefields against each other in a competitive sport called Zoids Battling. And uh, Atari made this and had the license. However, almost everything involving Zoids is very expensive these days, other than the toys. The DVDs and the games are quite rare. They cannot be re-released because of all the crazy licensing issues. So this game is actually pretty collectible. There's a lot of Zoids fans in the U.S. who are nostalgic for the old TV show or love the toys, the buildable models. So this is worth checking out. This is like the one Zoid game that I could say is pretty decent, has a pretty good selection of fan favorite Zoids. The Liger Zero, the, the Death Sword, the Geno Breaker, the Geno Sword. Yeah, I remember them. I love Zoids. I don't want to hear nothing about it. Zoids was fantastic. My boy Bit Cloud, he was the champ. So check it out. Zoids on the GameCube, exclusive, never getting re released. Zoids Battle Legends. Good game. All right. Now we're talking about not so much an exclusive, but a uh, special compilation that's only on the GameCube in the United States at the very least is the Sonic Gems Collections. Now, for my European buddies out there, yes, you also got this game on the PlayStation 2. Lucky you. We didn't get that in the U.S. We only got this on the GameCube. So what is this? This is a collection of Sonic games, much like the prior and very famous Sonic Mega Collection that collected a bunch of Genesis Sonic games. This has some more obscure titles on it. There is the famous Sonic CD, which is a fantastic game that has been re-released since, and you can get in other places. There is, of course, the first console release of Sonic the Fighters, also known as Sonic Championship. One of the greatest fight. I can't even say that 
sense. It's one of the worst fighting games ever made, but it is one of the funniest fighting games ever made. Um, basically a 3D fighting Sonic game made by the Virtual Fighter team that is just wacky and fun to play, as well as a number of Game Gear games uh, that were at the time very hard to come by unless you had a Game Gear. But the real gem on this is Sonic R, a foot racing game that some people love and some people hate. The people that hate it are wrong. It's great. It's a lot of fun. It's got a great soundtrack. It's a Sega Saturn game that... Uh, you either have to have a Sega Saturn for or a PC with the old disc for because there has been no uh, re-release of Sonic R since this game. The most modern version of Sonic R, which is a decently sought after game, both because of its infamy and because of the Sonic character, um, is found on this collection in Sonic Gem. So if you're looking to get Sonic R, this is probably the easiest way to do it. You also get Sonic CD, which is a great game, and Sonic the Fighters, which is a hilarious game. This is actually going up in price because of this. It's a GameCube exclusive in North America. People love Sonic, and some of these games have not had a ton of wide re-releases other than Sonic CD. So yeah, please check this out. Sonic Gems Collection, if you're a Sonic fan, on the GameCube, getting expensive. Don't let this one disappear if you're a Sonic fan. You gotta play Sonic R. You gotta hear that soundtrack to believe it. It's fantastic. And lastly, I'm gonna be talking about a game that is not exactly rare or unheard of, but it's getting expensive and I just want to bring up, bring it up. And that is the game that keeps the GameCube alive, that is Super Smash Bros. Melee. What can I say about this? This is the Marvel vs. Capcom 2 of GameCube. Like this is an OG fighting game, platform fighting game, whatever you want to call it, that people love to this day. Um, it is incredibly fast and stylish and very reminiscent of the GameCube era, but because there's been no digital re-release of this game, people keep it. It is at tournaments. Uh, despite all the future releases of Smash Brothers, this is always released right next to it. So because of that, there's a dwindling number of copies, despite it being a huge seller, um, and the price is just shooting up. It is worth getting. Get it now, because Nintendo is never re-releasing this. They want you to play the new Smash game. Get it before the price goes up even further. Still a great game. Still has that Nintendo charm. Love the visuals in this. Check it out. If you don't know, I mean, do you even have a GameCube? Super Smash Brothers Melee. Um, yeah, and that does it so much for the games in my collection. Now, there are plenty more rare, expensive, and uh, obtuse and obscure GameCube games that we'll go over in future videos, but these are kind of the lion's share of what I wanted to talk about today. But as a quick aside, the GameCube also has some very rare accessories. One of the ones that uh, I want to talk about, you've seen in the corner of your eye this whole video, and that is right here, the GameCube player, or the Game Boy GameCube Game Boy Player, that's a mouthful, which also came with this disc and manual. What does this do? It lets you play your Game Boy on the television set, which is just wonderful. Uh, kind of a, a unique idea. It's even harder to do today. It's not the easiest thing in the world to hook your Nintendo 3DS up to the TV. Uh, you can't just plug it into your Switch or anything like that. So they sold this bonus attachment that let you jam your game, your game uh, right into the console. You screw this base onto the GameCube, and you can play your portable games right on the television when you pop this disc in. This is very sought after. This is going near $200 because it's the last easy way to really do that. And there's some uh, there's some Game Boy games that actually allow bonus features, some color options when you plug it into the GameCube. So yeah, very sought after, but worth it. Uh, I bought it secondhand. These things are sturdy. Just make sure that disc works. Um, if you're a big enough Game Boy, uh, Game Boy fan or you know, you're just collecting good GameCube accessories, make sure you get the base and the disc. You can't use them by themselves. You do need both. So yeah, let me give you a good look at that. That is the Game B uh, GameCube Game Boy Player Disc. You need that and you need the base. It's not hard to pop in. You just need a quick screwdriver and that'll go right in the bottom. And you can play your Game Boy games right on TV. How great is that? Um, and just kind of a testament to how much people love the GameCube and particularly Smash Brothers Melee. They keep making GameCube controllers for future systems up until this day for the recent releases of Smash Brothers 4 for uh, Wii U and for 3DS and for Ultimate, they made more GameCube controllers. What you see here with this uh, flaming Smash logo in the center, this was the Smash for Wii U controller that they released because people just love the uh, feel of the GameCube controller for that game and for other games. I mean, the D-pad, I mean, you kind of need like a special dialing wand or an incredibly small thumb to like that thing, but everything else on this just feels really good for that game. And they released it again with a different Smash logo. This is also pretty collectible on the Switch. So yeah, people love this wacky controller. And it feels pretty good in the hands. It's worth checking out. Um, and this is compatible with a number of games, including the one you've seen behind me, the Super Mario Sunshine on the Switch. Thank God they added that in a patch. And as a last little note, the game that you've seen here the whole time, Soul Calibur 2, now this is on a multitude of consoles, famously having a guest character from each, but you will never ever get Link and Soul Calibur again. The re-release only had Spawn and Heihachi in it on the Xbox 360 and PS3. And while I am a Spawn shill, I always thought he was the best because it was the most ridiculous. 
Unfortunately, that version did not include Link, and I can't see them re-releasing this version of the game anytime soon. So if you want to play as Link in a 3D fighting game that's really, really good, get Soul Calibur 2 on the GameCube. Not expensive. So yeah, that kind of wraps up what I want to talk about with the GameCube today. We got some great games, some great ports, some great versions of games, some great hardware. We got some good controllers that are still being made to this day. And this kind of all adds up to the GameCube being probably my favorite Nintendo console. Yes, there has been great consoles ever since, but they went in a very different direction with consoles than Nintendo did after the GameCube. The Wii, of course, tried to capture more of a casual audience and had some fantastic titles that I've gone over in another video. But the GameCube just try to go for something else. They were weird and they went for the niche audiences and the third party audiences. They went for adult games right off the bat with like games like Resident Evil and Metal Gear Solid. But of course they had great titles, uh, more traditional like Mario Sunshine and uh, Wario Land and Luigi's Mansion. Just kind of experimenting with their characters with Wind Waker and Twilight Princess, all great games that um, people are looking back at now and collecting and making the price of this console and its games just shoot up. So please go out and get them while you still can, while they're still affordable, because this console is meant to be remembered. And please, please, Nintendo, let us download these games. It is insane to me that you can download on almost everything Nintendo, Super Nintendo, N64, and Wii games, but not GameCube. For whatever reason, it, they just don't want you to. They want you to buy the HD versions at full price, like you know, Wind Waker HD or Mario Sunshine, which are both limited or rare. So yes, hopefully one day Nintendo will let some of these games be re-released digitally, but until this day, you still need to get this little box or at least the original Wii that plays them, and you gotta get these games. And let me tell you, if you have the extra money, if you can afford it and you don't, you're not hurting yourself, it's well worth it because this console is well worth remembering for all the classic titles that it's had. And that kind of does it for my talk on the Nintendo GameCube. Thank you so much for listening to me rant and ramble about how much I love this little purple box. I love all the consoles in this generation. Like I said, Xbox, PS3, and GameCube. And the GameCube uh, definitely stands out and distinguishes itself amongst those consoles. So yet again, thank you for watching, for joining. Please look forward to future video game collecting uh, videos of mine, the rare, the weird, and expensive. I appreciate your time. My name is Mike. This has been Chip Damage, and thank you for joining.